This is the SFF Audio Podcast. Today's podcast is a reading of The Shadow Kingdom by Robert E. Howard. It comes to us courtesy of Tantor Media and their collection, Cull, Exile of Atlantis. Join us for our discussion of it afterwards. The Shadow Kingdom 1. A King Comes Riding The blare of the trumpets grew louder, like a deep golden tide surge, like the soft booming of the evening tides against the silver beaches of Elysia. The throng shouted, women flung roses from the roofs as the rhythmic chiming of silver hoofs came clearer, and the first of the mighty array swung into view in the broad white street that curved round the golden-spired Tower of Splendor. First came the trumpeters, slim youths, clad in scarlet, riding with a flourish of long, slender golden trumpets. Next the bowmen, tall men from the mountains, and behind these the heavily armed footmen, their broad shields clashing in unison, their long spears swaying in perfect rhythm to their stride. Behind them came the mightiest soldiery in all the world, the Red Slayers, horsemen, splendidly mounted, armed in red from helmet to spur. Proudly they sat their steeds, looking neither to right nor to left, but aware of the shouting for all that. Like bronze statues they were, and there was never a waver in the forest of spears that reared above them. Behind those proud and terrible ranks came the motley files of the mercenaries, fierce, wild-looking warriors, men of Mu and of Ka'u, and of the hills of the east and the isles of the west. They bore spears and heavy swords, and a compact group that marched somewhat apart were the bowmen of Lemuria. Then came the light foot of the nation and more trumpeters brought up the rear. A brave sight, and a sight which aroused a fierce thrill in the soul of Cull, king of Elysia. Not on the topaz throne at the front of the regal Tower of Splendor sat Cull, but in the saddle, mounted on a great stallion, a true warrior king. His mighty arms swung up in reply to the salutes as the hosts passed, His fierce eyes passed the gorgeous trumpeters with a casual glance, rested longer on the following soldiery. They blazed with a ferocious light as the red slayers halted in front of him with a clang of arms and a rearing of steeds, and tendered him the crown salute. They narrowed slightly as the mercenaries strode by. They saluted no one, the mercenaries. They walked with shoulders flung back, eyeing Cull boldly and straightly, albeit with a certain appreciation. Fierce eyes unblinking, savage eyes, staring from beneath shaggy manes and heavy brows. And Cull gave back a like stare. He granted much to brave men, and there were no braver in all the world, not even among the wild tribesmen who now disowned him. But Cull was too much the savage to have any great love for these. There were too many feuds. Many were age-old enemies of Cull's nation. And though the name of Cull was now a word accursed among the mountains and valleys of his people, and though Cull had put them from his mind, yet the old hates, the ancient passions still lingered. For Cull was no Volusian, but an Atlantean. The armies swung out of sight around the gem-blazing shoulders of the Tower of Splendor, and Cull reined his stallion about and started toward the palace at an easy gate, discussing the review with the commanders that rode with him, using not many words, but saying much. The army is like a sword, said Cull, and must not be allowed to rust. So down the street they rode, and Cull gave no heed to any of the whispers that reached his hearing from the throngs that still swarmed the streets. That is Cull, see? Valka, but what a king, and what a man! Look at his arms, his shoulders! 
and an undertone of more sinister whisperings. Cull! Ha! A cursed usurper from the pagan isles! I shame to Belusia that a barbarian sits on the throne of kings! Little did Cull heed. Heavy-handed had he seized the decaying throne of ancient Volusia, and with a heavier hand did he hold it, a man against a nation. After the council chamber, the social palace where Cull replied to the formal and laudatory phrases of the lords and ladies, with carefully hidden, grim amusement at such frivolities. Then the lords and ladies took their formal departure, and Cull leaned back upon the ermine throne and contemplated matters of state until an attendant requested permission from the great king to speak, and announced an emissary from the Pictish embassy. Cull brought his mind back from the dim mazes of illusion statecraft where it had been wandering, and gazed upon the Pict with little favor. The man gave back the gaze of the king without flinching. He was a lean-hipped, massive-chested warrior of middle height, dark, like all his race, and strongly built. From strong, immobile features gazed dauntless and inscrutable eyes. The chief of the councillors, Kanu of the tribe, right hand of the king of Pictum, sends greetings and says, There is a throne at the feast of the rising moon for Kal, king of kings, lord of lords, emperor of Alusia. Good, answered Kal. Say to Kanu the Ancient, ambassador of the Western Isles, that the king of Volusia will quaff wine with him when the moon floats over the hills of Zalgara. Still the Pict lingered. I have a word for the king, not— with a contemptuous flirt of his hand. For these slaves— Cull dismissed the attendants with a word, watching the Pict warily. The man stepped nearer and lowered his voice. Come alone to feast tonight, Lord King. Such was the word of my chief. The king's eyes narrowed, gleaming like gray sword steel, coldly. Alone? Aye. They eyed each other silently, their mutual tribal enmity seething beneath their cloak of formality. Their mouths spoke the cultured speech, the conventional court phrases of a highly polished race, a race not their own, but from their eyes gleamed the primal traditions of the elemental savage. Cull might be the king of Volusia, and the Pict might be an emissary to the courts, but there in the throne hall of kings two tribesmen glowered at each other, fierce and wary, while ghosts of wild wars and world ancient feuds whispered to each. To the king was the advantage, and he enjoyed it to its fullest extent. Jaw resting on hand, he eyed the Pict, who stood like an image of bronze, head flung back, eyes unflinching. Across Cull's lips stole a smile that was more a sneer. And so I am to come, alone. Civilization had taught him to speak by innuendo, and the Pict's dark eyes glittered, though he made no reply. How am I to know that you come from Kanu? I have spoken, was the sullen response. And when did a Pict speak truth? sneered Cull, fully aware that the Picts never lied, but using this means to enrage the man. I see your plan, King, the Pict answered imperturbably. You wish to anger me. By Valka you need go no further. I am angry enough and I challenge you to meet me in single battle, spear, sword, or dagger, mounted or afoot. Are you king or man? Cull's eyes glinted with the grudging admiration a warrior must needs give a bold foeman, but he did not fail to use the chance of further annoying his antagonist. A king does not accept the challenge of a nameless savage, he sneered nor does the Emperor of Volusia break the truce of ambassadors. You have leave to go. Say to Kanu, I will come alone. The Pict's eyes flashed murderously. He fairly shook in the grasp of the primitive bloodlust. Then, turning his back squarely upon the King of Volusia, 
he strode across the hall of society and vanished through the great door. Again, Cull leaned back upon the ermine throne and meditated. So the chief of the Council of Picts wished him to come alone. But for what reason? Treachery? Grimly, Cull touched the hilt of his great sword, but scarcely. The Picts valued too greatly the alliance with Volusia to break it for any feudal reason. Cull might be a warrior of Atlantis, an hereditary enemy of all Picts, but too he was king of Volusia, the most potent ally of the men of the West. Cull reflected long upon the strange state of affairs that made him ally of ancient foes and foe of ancient friends. He rose and paced restlessly across the hall with the quick, noiseless tread of a lion. Chains of friendship, tribe, and tradition had he broken to satisfy his ambition. And by Valka, god of the sea and the land, he had realized that ambition. He was king of Volusia, a fading, degenerate Volusia, a Volusia living mostly in dreams of bygone glory, but still a mighty land and the greatest of the seven empires. Volusia, land of dreams, the tribesmen named it, and sometimes it seemed to Cull that he moved in a dream. Strange to him were the intrigues of court and palace, army and people. All was like a masquerade, where men and women hid their real thoughts with a smooth mask. Yet the seizing of the throne had been easy. A bold snatching of opportunity, the swift whirl of swords, the slaying of a tyrant of whom men had wearied unto death, short, crafty plotting with ambitious statesmen out of favor at court. And Cull, wandering adventurer, Atlantean exile, had swept up to the dizzy heights of his dreams. He was Lord of Illusia, King of Kings. Yet now it seemed that the seizing was far easier than the keeping. The sight of the Pict had brought back youthful associations to his mind, the free, wild savagery of his boyhood. And now a strange feeling of dim unrest, of unreality, stole over him as of late it had been doing. Who was he, a straightforward man of the seas and the mountain, to rule a race strangely and terribly wise with the mysticisms of antiquity? An ancient race. I am Cull, said he, flinging back his head as a lion flings back his mane. I am Cull! His falcon gaze swept the ancient hall. His self-confidence flowed back. And, in a dim nook of the hall, a tapestry moved. Slightly. 2. Thus spake the silent halls of Illusia. The moon had not risen, and the garden was lighted with torches aglow in silver cressets when Cull sat down on the throne before the table of Kanu, ambassador of the Western Isles. At his right hand sat the ancient Pict, as much unlike an emissary of that fierce race as a man could be. Ancient was Kanu, and wise in statecraft, grown old in the game. There was no elemental hatred in the eyes that looked at Cull appraisingly. No tribal traditions hindered his judgments. Long associations with the statesmen of the civilized nations had swept away such cobwebs. Not, who and what is this man, was the question ever foremost in Kanu's mind, but, can I use this man, and how? Tribal prejudices he used only to further his own schemes. And Cull watched Kanu, answering his conversation briefly, wondering if civilization would make of him a thing like the Pict. For Kanu was soft and paunchy. Many years had stridden across the sky rim since Kanu had wielded a sword. True, he was old, but Cull had seen men older than he in the forefront of battle. The Picts were a long lived race. A beautiful girl stood at Kanu's elbow, refilling his goblet, and she was kept busy. Meanwhile, Kanu kept up a running fire of jests and comments, and Cull, secretly contemptuous of his garrulity, nevertheless missed none of his shrewd humor. At the banquet were Pictus chiefs and statesmen, 
the latter jovial and easy in their manner, the warriors formally courteous, but plainly hampered by their tribal affinities. Yet Cull, with a tinge of envy, was cognizant of the freedom and ease of the affair, as contrasted with like affairs of the Volusian court. Such freedom prevailed in the rude camps of Atlantis. Cull shrugged his shoulders. After all, doubtless Kanu, who would seem to have forgotten he was a Pict as far as time hoary custom and prejudice went, was right, and he, Cull, would better become a Volusian in mind as in name. At last, when the moon had reached her zenith, Kanu, having eaten and drunk as much as any three men there, leaned back upon his divan with a comfortable sigh and said, Now get you gone, friends, for the king and I would converse on such matters as concerns not children. Yes, you too, my pretty. Yet first let me kiss those ruby lips. So, now dance away, my rose bloom. Kanu's eyes twinkled above his white beard as he surveyed Kull, who sat erect, grim and uncompromising. You are thinking, Kull, said the old statesman suddenly, that Kanu is a useless old reprobate, fit for nothing except to guzzle wine and kiss wenches. In fact, this remark was so much in line with his actual thoughts, and so plainly put, that Kull was rather startled, though he gave no sign. Kanu gurgled, and his paunch shook with his mirth. "'Wine is red, and women are soft,' he remarked tolerantly. "'But, ha, <laughs> ha, think not old Kanu allows either to interfere with business.' Again he laughed, and Kull moved restlessly. This seemed much like being made sport of, and the king's scintillant eyes began to glow with a feline light. Kanu reached for the wine pitcher filled his beaker and glanced questioningly at Kull, who shook his head irritably. Aye, said Kanu equably, it takes an old head to stand strong drink. I am growing old, Kull, so why should you young men begrudge me such pleasures as we oldsters must find? Ah, me, I grow ancient and withered, friendless and cheerless but his looks and expressions failed far of bearing out his words. His rubicund countenance fairly glowed, and his eyes sparkled so that his white beard seemed incongruous. Indeed, he looked remarkably elfin, reflected Cull, who felt vaguely resentful. The old scoundrel had lost all of the primitive virtues of his race, and of Cull's race, yet he seemed more pleased in his aged days than otherwise. Hark ye call, said Kanu, raising an admonitory finger. Tis a chancy thing to laud a young man. Yet I must speak my true thoughts to gain your confidence. If you think to gain it by flattery. Tush! Who spoke of flattery? I flatter only to discard. There was a keen sparkle in Kanu's eyes, a cold glimmer that did not match his lazy smile. He knew men, and he knew that to gain his end he must smite straight with this tigerish barbarian, who, like a wolf scenting a snare, would scent out unerringly any falseness in the skein of his word-web. "'You have power, Cull," said he, choosing his words with more care than he did in the council rooms of the nation, "'to make yourself mightiest of all kings, and to restore some of the lost glories of Elusia. So, I care little for Volusia, though the woman and wine be excellent, save for the fact that the stronger Volusia is, the stronger is the picked nation. More, with an Atlantean on the throne, eventually Atlantis will become united. Cull laughed in harsh mockery. Kanu had touched an old wound. Atlantis made my name accursed when I went to seek fame and fortune among the cities of the world. We, they, are age-old foes of the Seven Empires, greater foes of the allies of the empires, as you should know. Kanu tugged his beard and smiled enigmatically. Nay, nay, let it pass. But I know whereof I speak. 
and then warfare will cease wherein there is no gain. I see a world of peace and prosperity, man loving his fellow man, the good supreme. All this can you accomplish, if you live. Ha! Cull's lean hand closed on his hilt, and he half rose, with a sudden movement of such dynamic speed that Kanu, who fancied men as some men fancied blooded horses, felt his old blood leap with a sudden thrill. Valka, what a warrior! Nerves and sinews of steel and fire, bound together with a perfect coordination, the fighting instinct that makes the terrible warrior. But none of Kanu's enthusiasm showed in his mildly sarcastic tone. Tush! Be seated. Look about you. The gardens are deserted, the seats empty save for ourselves. You fear not me. Cull sank back, gazing about him warily. There speaks the savage, mused Kanu. Think you, if I planned treachery, I would enact it here where suspicion would be sure to fall upon me? Tut! You young tribesmen have much to learn. There were my chiefs who were not at ease because you were born among the hills of Atlantis, and you despise me in your secret mind because I am a Pict. Tush! I see you as Cull, king of Volusia, not as Cull, the reckless Atlantean, leader of the raiders who harried the Western Isles. So you should see in me, not a Pict, but an international man, a figure of the world. Now to that figure, hark! If you were slain tomorrow, who would be king? Kanub, Baron of Blal. Even so, I object to Kanub for many reasons, yet most of all for the fact that he is but a figurehead. How so? He was my greatest opponent but I did not know that he championed any cause but his own. The knight can hear, answered Kanu obliquely. There are worlds within worlds. But you may trust me, and you may trust Brule, the spear-slayer. Look. He drew from his robes a bracelet of gold representing a winged dragon, coiled thrice, with three horns of ruby on the head. Examine it closely. Brule will wear it on his arm when he comes to you tomorrow night, so that you may know him. Trust Brule as you trust yourself, and do what he tells you to, and in proof of trust. Look ye! And with the speed of a striking hawk, the ancient snatched something from his robes, something that flung a weird green light over them, and which he replaced in an instant. The stolen gem! exclaimed Cull, recoiling. The green jewel from the Temple of the Serpent! Valka! You! And why do you show it to me? To save your life. To prove my trust. If I betray your trust, deal with me likewise. You hold my life in your hand. Now I could not be false to you if I would, for a word from you would be my doom. Yet, for all his words... The old scoundrel beamed merrily and seemed vastly pleased with himself. "'But why do you give me this hold over you?' asked Cull, becoming more bewildered each second. "'As I told you. Now you see that I do not intend to deal you false. And tomorrow night, when Brule comes to you, you will follow his advice without fear of treachery. Enough.' An escort waits outside to ride to the palace with you, lord. Cull rose. But you have told me nothing. Tush! How impatient are youths! Kanu looked more like a mischievous elf than ever. Go you, and dream of thrones and power and kingdoms, while I dream of wine and soft women and roses. And fortune ride with you, King Cull. As he left the garden, Cull glanced back to see Kanu still reclining lazily in his seat, a merry ancient, beaming on all the world with jovial fellowship. A mounted warrior waited for the king just without the garden, and Cull was slightly surprised to see that it was the same that had brought Kanu's invitation. 
No word was spoken as Cull swung into the saddle, nor as they clattered along the empty streets. The color and the gaiety of the day had given away to the eerie stillness of night. The city's antiquity was more than ever apparent beneath the bent silver moon. The huge pillars of the mansions and palaces towered up into the stars. The broad stairways, silent and deserted, seemed to climb endlessly until they vanished in the shadowy darkness of the upper realms. Stairs to the stars, thought Cull, his imaginative mind inspired by the weird grandeur of the scene. Clang! 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 sounded the silver hoofs on the broad, moon-flooded streets, but otherwise there was no sound. The age of the city, its incredible antiquity, was almost oppressive to the king. It was as if the great silent buildings laughed at him, noiselessly, with unguessable mockery. And what secrets did they hold? You are young, said the palaces and the temples and the shrines, but we are old. The world was wild with youth when we were reared. You and your tribe shall pass, but we are invincible, indestructible. We towered above a strange world ere Atlantis and Lemuria rose from the sea. We still shall reign when the green waters sigh from many a restless fathom above the spires of Lemuria and the hills of Atlantis, and when the isles of the western men are the mountains of a strange land. How many kings have we watched ride down these streets before Cull of Atlantis was even a dream in the mind of Ka, bird of creation? Ride on, Cull of Atlantis. Greater shall follow you. Greater came before you. They are dust. They are forgotten. We stand. We know. We are. Ride, ride on, Cull of Atlantis. Cull the king. Cull the fool. And it seemed to Cull that the clashing hoofs took up the silent refrain to beat it into the night with hollow, re-echoing mockery. Cull the king, cull the fool. Glow, moon, you light a king's way. Gleam, stars, you are torches in the train of an emperor. And clang, silver-shod hoofs, you herald that cull rides through Volusia. Ho! Awake, Volusia, it is cull that rides. Cull the king! We have known many kings, said the silent halls of Elusia. And so, in a brooding mood, Cull came to the palace, where his bodyguards, men of the Red Slayers, came to take the reign of the great stallion, and escort Cull to his rest. There the Pict, still sullenly speechless, wheeled his steed with a savage wrench of the rein, and fled away in the dark like a phantom. Cull's heightened imagination pictured him speeding through the silent streets like a goblin out of the Elder World. There was no sleep for Cull that night, for it was nearly dawn, and he spent the rest of the night hours pacing the throne room and pondering over what had passed. Kanu had told him nothing, yet he had put himself in Cull's complete power. At what had he hinted when he had said the Baron of Blau was not but a figurehead? And who was this Brule who was to come to him by night, wearing the mystic armlet of the dragon? And why? Above all, why had Kanu shown him the green gem of terror, stolen long ago from the Temple of the Serpent, for which the world would rock in wars were it known to the weird and terrible keepers of that temple, and from whose vengeance not even Kanu's ferocious tribesmen might be able to save him? But Kanu knew he was safe, reflected Cull, for the statesman was too shrewd to expose himself to risk without profit. But was it to throw the king off his guard and pave the way to treachery? Would Kanu dare let him live now? Cull shrugged his shoulders. 3. They That Walk the Night The moon had not risen when Cull 
hand to hilt, stepped to a window. The windows opened upon the great inner gardens of the royal palace, and the breezes of the night, bearing the scents of spice trees, blew the filmy curtains about. The king looked out. The walks and groves were deserted. Carefully trimmed trees were bulky shadows. Fountains nearby flung their slender sheen of silver in the starlight, and distant fountains rippled steadily. No guards walked those gardens, for so closely were the outer walls guarded that it seemed impossible for any invader to gain access to them. Vines curled up the walls of the palace, and even as Cull mused upon the ease with which they might be climbed, a segment of shadow detached itself from the darkness below the window, and a bare brown arm curved up over the sill. Cull's great sword hissed halfway from the sheath, then the king halted. Upon the muscular forearm gleamed the dragon armlet shown him by Kanu the night before. The possessor of the arm pulled himself up over the sill and into the room with the swift, easy motion of a climbing leopard. You are Brule? asked Cull, and then stopped in surprise, not unmingled with annoyance and suspicion. For the man was he whom Cull had taunted in the Hall of Society, the same who had escorted him from the Pictish embassy. I am Brule, the spear slayer, answered the Pict in a guarded voice. Then swiftly, Gazing closely in Cull's face, he said, barely above a whisper, Ka Nama, Ka Lajarama. Cull started. Ha! Huh? What mean you? You know not? Nay, the words are unfamiliar. They are of no language I ever heard. And yet, by Valka, somewhere. I have heard. I was the Pict's only comment. His eyes swept the room, the study room of the palace. Except for a few tables, a divan or two, and great shelves of books of parchment, the room was barren compared to the grandeur of the rest of the palace. Tell me, king, who guards the door? Eighteen of the Red Slayers. But how come you, stealing through the gardens by night and scaling the walls of the palace? Brule sneered. The gods of Volusia are blind buffaloes. I could steal their girls from under their noses. I stole amid them, and they saw me not, nor heard me. And the walls, I could scale them without the aid of vines. I have hunted tigers on the foggy beaches when the sharp east breezes blew the mist in from seaward, and I have climbed the steeps of the western sea mountain. But come. Nay, Touch this armlet. He held out his arm, and, as Cull complied wonderingly, gave an apparent sigh of relief. So, now throw off those kingly robes, for there are ahead of you this night such deeds as no Atlantean ever dreamed of. Brule himself was clad only in a scanty loincloth, through which was thrust a short curved sword. And who are you to give me orders? asked Cull, slightly resentful. "'Did not Kanu bid you follow me in all things?' asked the Pict irritably, his eyes flashing momentarily. "'I have no love for you, Lord, but for the moment I have put the thought of feuds from my mind. Do you likewise. But come.' Walking noiselessly, he led the way across the room to the door. A slide in the door allowed a view of the outer corridor— unseen from without, and the Pict bade Cull look. What see you? Not but the eighteen guardsmen. The Pict nodded, motioned Cull to follow him across the room. At a panel in the opposite wall, Brule stopped and fumbled there a moment. Then, with a light movement, he stepped back, drawing his sword as he did so. Cull gave an exclamation as the panel swung silently open, revealing a dimly lighted passageway. A secret passage, swore Cull softly, and I knew nothing of it. By Valka, someone shall dance for this. Silence, hissed the Pict. Brule was standing like a bronze statue, as if straining every nerve for the slightest sound. 
Something about his attitude made Cull's hair prickle slightly. Not from fear, but from some eerie anticipation. Then, beckoning, Brule stepped through the secret doorway, which stood open behind them. The passage was bare, but not dust-covered, as should have been the case with an unused secret corridor. A vague, gray light filtered through somewhere, but the source of it was not apparent. Every few feet Cull saw doors, invisible, as he knew, from the outside, but easily apparent from within. The palace is a very honeycomb, he muttered. Aye, night and day you are watched, king, by many eyes. The king was impressed by Brule's manner. The Pict went forward slowly, warily, half-crouching, blade held low and thrust forward. When he spoke it was in a whisper, and he continually flung glances from side to side. The corridor turned sharply, and Brule warily gazed past the turn. Look, he whispered, but remember, no word, no sound, on your life. Cull cautiously gazed past him. The corridor changed just at the bend to a flight of steps. And then Cull recoiled. At the foot of those stairs lay the eighteen red slayers who were that night stationed to watch the king's study room. Brule's grip upon his mighty arm and Brule's fierce whisper at his shoulder alone kept Cull from leaping down those stairs. Silent, Cull! Silent! In Valka's name! hissed the Pict. These corridors are empty now, but I risked much in showing you that you might then believe what I had to say. Back now to the room of study. And he retraced his steps, Cull following, his mind in a turmoil of bewilderment. This is treachery, muttered the king, his steel-gray eyes a smolder. Foul and swift! Mere minutes have passed since those men stood at guard. Again in the room of study, Brule carefully closed the secret panel and motioned Cull to look again through the slit of the outer door. Cull gasped audibly, for without stood the eighteen guardsmen. This is sorcery, he whispered, half drawing his sword. Do dead men guard the king? Aye, came Brule's scarcely audible reply. There was a strange expression in the Pict's scintillant eyes. They looked squarely into each other's eyes for an instant. Cull's brow wrinkled in a puzzled scowl as he strove to read the Pict's inscrutable face. Then Brule's lips, barely moving, formed the words, The snake that speaks. Silent, whispered Cull, laying his hand over Brule's mouth. That is death to speak. That is a name accursed. The Pict's fearless eyes regarded him steadily. Look again, Lord Cull. The chance the guard was changed. Nay, those are the same men. In Valka's name, this is sorcery. This is insanity. I saw with my own eyes the bodies of those men, not eight minutes agone. Yet there they stand. Brule stepped back, away from the door, Cull mechanically following. Cull, what know ye of the traditions of this race ye rule? Much, and yet little. Belusia is so old. Aye, Brule's eyes lighted strangely. We are but barbarians, infants compared to the seven empires. Not even they themselves know how old they are. Neither the memory of man nor the annals of the historians reach back far enough to tell us when the first men came up from the sea and built cities on the shore. But, Cull, men were not always ruled by men. The king started. Their eyes met. Aye. There is a legend of my people. And mine broke in Brule. That was before we of the Isles were allied with Volusia. 
I, in the reign of Lion Fang, seventh war chief of the Picts, so many years ago, no man remembers how many. Across the sea we came, from the Isles of the Sunset, skirting the shores of Atlantis, and falling upon the beaches of Elusia with fire and sword. I, the long white beaches resounded with a clash of spears, and the night was like day from the flame of the burning castles. And the king, the king of Volusia, who died on the Red Sea sands that dim day. His voice trailed off. The two stared at each other, neither speaking. Then each nodded. Ancient is Volusia, whispered Cull. The hills of Atlantis and Mu were isles of the sea when Volusia was young. The night breeze whispered through the open window. Not the free, crisp sea air such as Brule and Cull knew and reveled in, in their land, but a breath like a whisper from the past, laden with musk, scents of forgotten things, breathing secrets that were hoary when the world was young. The tapestries rustled, and suddenly Cull felt like a naked child before the inscrutable wisdom of the mystic past. Again the sense of unreality swept upon him. At the back of his soul stole dim, gigantic phantoms, whispering monstrous things. He sensed that Brule experienced similar thoughts. The Pict's eyes were fixed upon his face with a fierce intensity. Their glances met. Cull felt warmly a sense of comradeship with this member of an enemy tribe. Like rival leopards turning at bay against hunters, these two savages made common cause against the inhuman powers of antiquity. Brule again led the way back to the secret door. Silently they entered, and silently they proceeded down the dim corridor, taking the opposite direction from that in which they had previously traversed it. After a while, the Picts stopped and pressed close to one of the secret doors, bidding Cull look with him through the hidden slot. This opens upon a little-used stair which leads to a corridor, running past the study room door. They gazed, and presently, mounting the stair silently, came a silent shape. Two! Chief Counselor! exclaimed Cull. By night and with bare dagger. How? What means this Brule? Murder and foulest treachery, hissed Brule. Nay, as Cull would have flung the door aside and leaped forth. We are lost if you meet him here. For more lurk at the foot of those stairs. Come. Half running, they darted back along the passage. Back through the secret door Brule led, shutting it carefully behind them, then used the chamber to an opening into a room seldom used. There he swept aside some tapestries in a dim corner nook, and, drawing Cull with him, stepped behind them. Minutes dragged. Cull could hear the breeze in the other room blowing the window curtains about, and it seemed to him like the murmur of ghosts. Then, through the door, stealthily, came Tu, chief counselor of the king. Evidently he had come through the study room, and, finding it empty, sought his victim where he was most likely to be. He came with upraised dagger, walking silently. A moment he halted, gazing about the apparently empty room, which was lighted dimly by a single candle. Then he advanced cautiously, apparently at a loss to understand the absence of the king. He stood before the hiding place, and... Slay! hissed the Pict. Cull, with a single mighty leap, hurled himself into the room. Two spun, but the blinding, tigerish speed of the attack gave him no chance for defense or counterattack. Sword steel flashed in the dim light and grated on bone as two toppled backward. Cull's sword standing out between his shoulders. Cull leaned above him, teeth bared in the killer's snarl, heavy brows a scowl above eyes that were like the gray ice of the cold sea. Then he released the hilt and recoiled, shaken, 
dizzy, the hand of death at his spine. For as he watched, Tu's face became strangely dim and unreal. The features mingled and merged in a seemingly impossible manner. Then, like a fading mask of fog, the face suddenly vanished, and in its stead gaped and leered a monstrous serpent's head. Valka! gasped Cull, sweat beating his forehead. And again, Valka! Brule leaned forward, face immobile. Yet his glittering eyes mirrored something of Cull's horror. Regain your sword, Lord King, said he. There are yet deeds to be done. Hesitantly, Cull set his hand to the hilt. His flesh crawled as he set his foot upon the terror which lay at their feet, and as some jerk of muscular reaction caused the frightful mouth to gape suddenly, he recoiled, weak with nausea. Then, wrathful at himself, he plucked forth his sword and gazed more closely at the nameless thing that had been known as Two, Chief Counselor. Save for the reptilian head, the thing was the exact counterpart of a man. A man with the head of a snake, Cull murmured. This, then, is a priest of the serpent god? Aye, two sleeps unknowing. These fiends can take any form they will. That is, they can, by a magic charm or the like, fling a web of sorcery about their faces, as an actor dons a mask, so that they resemble anyone they wish to. Then the old legends were true, mused the king. The grim old tales few dare even whisper, lest they die as blasphemers, are no fantasies. By Valka, I had thought, I had guessed. But it seems beyond the bounds of reality. Ha! The guardsmen outside the door. They too are snake men. Hold! What would you do? Slay them, said Cull between his teeth. Strike at the skull, if at all, said Brule. Eighteen wait without the door, and perhaps a score more in the corridors. Hark ye, king! Kanu learned of this plot. His spies have pierced the inmost fastnesses of the snake priests, and they brought hints of a plot. Long ago he discovered the secret passageways of the palace, and at his command I studied the map thereof, and came here by night to aid you, lest you die as other kings of Elusia have died. I came alone for the reason that to send more would have roused suspicion. Many could not steal into the palace as I did. Some of the foul conspiracy you have seen. Snake men guard your door, and that one, as two, could pass anywhere else in the palace. In the morning, if the priests failed, the real guards would be holding their places again, nothing knowing, nothing remembering, there to take the blame if the priests succeeded. But stay you here while I dispose of this carrion. So saying, the Pict shouldered the frightful thing stolidly and vanished with it through another secret panel. Cull stood alone, his mind a whirl. Neophytes of the mighty serpent, how many lurked among his cities? How might he tell the false from the true? Aye, how many of his trusted counselors? His generals were men. He could be certain of whom. The secret panel swung inward, and Brule entered. You were swift. I. The warrior stepped forward, eyeing the floor. There is gore upon the rug, see? Cull bent forward. From the corner of his eye he saw a blur of movement, a glint of steel. Like a loosened bow he whipped erect, thrusting upward. The warrior sagged upon the sword, his own clattering to the floor. Even at that instant Cull reflected grimly that it was appropriate that the traitor should meet his death upon the sliding upward thrust used so much by his race. Then, as Brule slid from the sword to sprawl motionless on the floor, the face began to merge and fade. And as Cull caught his breath, his hair a prickle, the human features vanished, 
and there the jaws of a great snake gaped hideously, the terrible beady eyes venomous even in death. He was a snake priest all the time, gasped the king. Valka! What an elaborate plan to throw me off my guard! Kanu there. Is he a man? Was it Kanu to whom I talked in the gardens? Almighty Valka! As his flesh crawled with a horrid thought, Are the people of Volusia men, or are they all serpents? Undecided he stood, idly seeing that the thing named Brule no longer wore the dragon armlet. A sound made him wheel. Brule was coming through the secret door. Hold! Upon the arm upthrown to halt the king's hovering sword gleamed the dragon armlet. Vulca! The Pict stopped short. Then a grim smile curled his lips. By the gods of the seas, these demons are crafty past reckoning. For it must be that that one lurked in the corridors, and seeing me go carrying the carcass of that other took my appearance. So, I have another to do away with. Hold! There was the menace of death in Cull's voice. I have seen two men turn to serpents before my eyes. How may I know if you are a true man? Brule laughed. For two reasons, King Cull. No snake man wears this. He indicated the dragon armlet. Nor can any say these words. And again, Cull heard the strange phrase. Kanama. Ka la jarama. Ka nama, ka la jarama, Kull repeated mechanically. And where in Valka's name have I heard that? I have not, and yet, and yet. Aye, you remember, Kull, said Brule. Through the dim corridors of memory those words lurk. Though you never heard them in this life, yet in the bygone ages they were so terribly impressed upon the soul mind that never dies, that they will always strike dim chords in your memory, though you be reincarnated for a million years to come. For that phrase has come secretly down the grim and bloody eons since when, uncounted centuries ago, those words were watchwords for the race of men who battled with the grisly beings of the Elder Universe. For none but a real man of men may speak them, whose jaws and mouth are shaped different from any other creature. Their meaning has been forgotten, but not the words themselves. True, said Cull. I remember the legends. Valka! He stopped short, staring. For suddenly, like the silence swinging wide of a mystic door, Misty, unfathomed reaches opened in the recesses of his consciousness, and for an instant he seemed to gaze back through the vastnesses that spanned life and life, seeing through the vague and ghostly fogs, dim shapes reliving dead centuries, men in combat with hideous monsters, vanquishing a planet of frightful terrors, Against a gray, ever-shifting background moved strange nightmare forms, fantasies of lunacy and fear. And man, the jest of the gods, the blind, wisdomless striver from dust to dust, following the long, bloody trail of his destiny, knowing not why, bestial, blundering, like a great murderous child, yet feeling somewhere a spark of divine fire. Cull drew a hand across his brow, shaken. These sudden glimpses into the abysses of memory always startled him. They are gone, said Brule, as if scanning his secret mind. The bird women, the harpies, the bat men, the flying fiends, the wolf people, the demons, the goblins— all save such as this being that lies at our feet, and a few of the wolfmen. Long and terrible was the war, lasting through the bloody centuries, since first the first men, risen from the mire of apedom, turned upon those who then ruled the world. And at last mankind conquered, 
so long ago that not but dim legends come to us through the ages. The snake people were the last to go. Yet at last men conquered even them and drove them forth into the wastelands of the world, there to mate with true snakes, until some day, say the sages, the horrid breed shall vanish utterly. Yet the things returned in crafty guise as men grew soft and degenerate, forgetting ancient wars. Ah, that was a grim and secret war. Among the men of the younger earth stole the frightful monsters of the elder planet, safeguarded by their horrid wisdom and mysticisms, taking all forms and shapes, doing deeds of horror secretly. No man knew who was true man and who false. No man could trust any man. Yet by means of their own craft they formed ways by which the false might be known from the true. Men took for a sign and a standard the figure of the flying dragon, the winged dinosaur, a monster of past ages which was the greatest foe of the serpent. And men used those words which I spoke to you as a sign and symbol, for as I said, none but a true man can repeat them. So mankind triumphed. Yet again the fiends came, after the years of forgetfulness had gone by, for man is still an ape in that he forgets what is not ever before his eyes. As priests they came, and for that men in their luxury and might had by then lost faith in the old religions and worships. Teachers of a new and truer cult built a monstrous religion about the worship of the serpent god. Such is their power that it is now death to repeat the old legends of the snake people, and people bow again to the serpent god in new form. And blind fools that they are, the great hosts of men see no connection between this power and the power men overthrew eons ago. As priests, the snake men are content to rule, and yet— He stopped. Go on. Cull felt an unaccountable stirring of the short hair at the base of his scalp. Kings have reigned as true men in Volusia, the Pict whispered, and yet slain in battle have died serpents, as died he who fell beneath the spear of Lionfang on the red beaches when we of the Isles harried the seven empires. And how can this be, Lord Cull? These kings were born of women and lived as men. This, the true kings, died in secret, as you would have died tonight, and priests of the serpent reigned in their stead, no man knowing. Cull cursed between his teeth. Aye, it must be. No one has ever seen a priest of the serpent and lived, that is known. They live in utmost secrecy. The statecraft of the seven empires is a mazy, monstrous thing said Bruel. There the true men know that among them glide the spies of the serpent, and the men who are the serpent's allies, such as Kanub, Baron of Blal. Yet no man dares seek to unmask a suspect, lest vengeance befall him. No man trusts his fellow, and the true statesmen dare not speak to each other what is in the minds of all. Could they be sure— could a snake-man or plot be unmasked before them all, then would the power of the serpent be more than half broken. For all would then ally and make common cause, sifting out the traitors. Kanu alone is of sufficient shrewdness and courage to cope with them. And even Kanu learned only enough of their plot to tell me what would happen, what has happened up to this time. Thus far I was prepared. From now on, we must trust to our luck and our craft. Here and now I think we are safe. Those snake men without the door dare not leave their post, lest true men come here unexpectedly. But tomorrow they will try something else, you may be sure. Just what they will do, none can say, not even Kanu. But we must stay at each other's sides, King Kull, until we conquer or both be dead. Now come with me while I take this carcass to the hiding place where I took the other being.
Cull followed the Pict with his grisly burden through the secret panel and down the dim corridor. Their feet, trained to the silence of the wilderness, made no noise. Like phantoms they glided through the ghostly light, Cull wondering that the corridor should be deserted. At every turn he expected to run full upon some frightful apparition. Suspicion surged back upon him. Was this Pict leading him into ambush? He fell back a pace or two behind Bruel, his ready sword hovering at the Pict's unheeding back. Bruel should die first if he meant treachery. But if the Pict was aware of the king's suspicion, he showed no sign. Stolidly he tramped along, until they came to a room, dusty and long unused, where moldy tapestries hung heavy. Brule drew aside some of these and concealed the corpse behind them. Then they turned to retrace their steps, when suddenly Brule halted with such abruptness that he was closer to death than he knew, for Cull's nerves were on edge. Something's moving in the corridor, hissed the Pict. Kanu said these ways would be empty, yet... He drew his sword and stole into the corridor. Cull followed warily. A short way down the corridor a strange, vague glow appeared that came toward them. Nerves a leap, they waited, backs to the corridor wall, for what they knew not. But Cull heard Brule's breath hiss through his teeth and was reassured as to Brule's loyalty. The glow merged into a shadowy form. A shape, vaguely like a man it was, but misty and elusive, like a wisp of fog that grew more tangible as it approached, but never fully material. A face looked at them, a pair of luminous great eyes that seemed to hold all the tortures of a million centuries. There was no menace in that face, with its dim, worn features but only a great pity. And that face, that face... Almighty gods! breathed Cull, an icy hand at his soul. Ilal, king of Volusia, who died a thousand years ago. Brule shrank back as far as he could. His narrow eyes widened in a blaze of pure horror, the sword shaking in his grip, unnerved for the first time that weird night. Erect and defiant stood Cull, instinctively holding his useless sword at the ready, flesh a crawl, hair a prickle, yet still a king of kings, as ready to challenge the powers of the unknown dead as the powers of the living. The phantom came straight on, giving them no heed. Cull shrank back as it passed them, feeling an icy breath like a breeze from the arctic snow. Straight on went the shape, with slow, silent footsteps, as if the chains of all the aged were upon those vague feet, vanishing about a bend of the corridor. Valka, muttered the Pict, wiping the cold beads from his brow. That was no man. That was a ghost. I. Cull shook his head wonderingly. Did you not recognize the face? That was Ialal, who reigned in Volusia a thousand years ago, and who was found hideously murdered in his throne room, the room now known as the Accursed Room. Have you not seen his statue in the Fame Room of Kings? Yes, I remember the tale now. God's cult, that is another sign of the frightful and foul power of the snake priests. That king was slain by snake people, and thus his soul became their slave, to do their bidding throughout eternity. For the sages have ever maintained that if a man is slain by a snake man, his ghost becomes their slave. A shudder shook Cull's gigantic frame. Valka! But what a fate! Hark ye! His fingers closed upon Brule's sinewy arm like steel. Hark ye! If I am wounded unto death by these foul monsters, swear that ye will smite your sword through my breast, lest my soul be enslaved. I swear, answered Brule, his fierce eyes lighting. And do ye the same by me, Cull. 
their strong right hands met in a silent sealing of their bloody bargain. 4. Masks Cull sat upon his throne and gazed broodingly out upon the sea of faces turned toward him. A courtier was speaking in evenly modulated tones, but the king scarcely heard him. Close by, too, chief counselor, stood ready at Cull's command, and each time the king looked at him, Cull shuddered inwardly. The surface of court life was as the unrippled surface of the sea between tide and tide. To the musing king, the affairs of the night before seemed as a dream, until his eyes dropped to the arm of his throne. A brown, sinewy hand rested there, upon the wrist of which gleamed a dragon armlet. Brule stood beside his throne, and ever the Pict's fierce secret whisper brought him back from the realm of unreality in which he moved. No, that was no dream, that monstrous interlude. As he sat upon his throne in the Hall of Society and gazed upon the courtiers, the ladies, the lords, the statesmen, he seemed to see their faces as things of illusion, things unreal, existent only as shadows and mockeries of substance. Always he had seen their faces as masks, but before he had looked on them with contemptuous tolerance, thinking to see beneath the masks shallow, puny souls, avaricious, lustful, deceitful. Now there was a grim undertone, a sinister meaning, a vague horror that lurked beneath the smooth masks. While he exchanged courtesies with some nobleman or counselor, he seemed to see the smiling face fade like smoke, and the frightful jaws of a serpent gaping there. How many of those he looked upon were horrid, inhuman monsters, plotting his death beneath the smooth, mesmeric illusion of a human face? Belusia, land of dreams and nightmares a kingdom of the shadows, ruled by phantoms who glided back and forth behind the painted curtains, mocking the feudal king who sat upon the throne, himself a shadow. And like a comrade shadow, Brule stood by his side, dark eyes glittering from a mobile face. A real man, Brule. And Cull felt his friendship for the savage become a thing of reality, and sensed that Brule felt a friendship for him beyond the mere necessity of statecraft. And what, mused Cull, were the realities of life? Ambition? Power? Pride? The friendship of man? The love of women? Which Cull had never known. Battle? Plunder? What? Was it the real Cull who sat upon the throne? Or was it the real cull who had scaled the hills of Atlantis, harried the far isles of the sunset, and laughed upon the green, roaring tides of the Atlantean sea? How could a man be so many different men in a lifetime? For cull knew that there were many culls, and he wondered which was the real cull. After all, the priests of the serpent merely went a step further in their magic. For all men wore masks and many a different mask with each different man or woman. And Cull wondered if a serpent did not lurk under every mask. So he sat and brooded in strange, mazy thought ways. And the courtiers came and went, and the minor affairs of the day were completed, until at last the king and Brule sat alone in the hall of society, save for the drowsy attendants. Cull felt a weariness. Neither he nor Brule had slept the night before, nor had Cull slept the night before that, when in the gardens of Kanu he had had his first hint of the weird things to be. Last night nothing further had occurred after they had returned to the study room from the secret corridors, but they had neither dared nor cared to sleep. Cull, with the incredible vitality of a wolf, had aforetime gone for days upon days without sleep in his wild savage days. But now his mind was edged from constant thinking and from the nerve-breaking eeriness of the past night. He needed sleep, but sleep was furthest from his mind. And he would not have dared sleep if he had thought of it. 
Another thing that had shaken him was the fact that though he and Brule had kept a close watch to see if or when the study-room guard was changed, yet it was changed without their knowledge. For the next morning those who stood on guard were able to repeat the magic words of Brule, but they remembered nothing out of the ordinary. They thought that they had stood at guard all night as usual, and Cull said nothing to the contrary. He believed them true men, but Brule had advised absolute secrecy, and Cull also thought it best. Now Brule leaned over the throne, lowering his voice so not even a lazy attendant could hear. They will strike soon, I think, Cull. A while ago, Kanu gave me a secret sign. The priests know that we know of their plot, of course. But they know not how much we know. We must be ready for any sort of action. Kanu and the Pictish chiefs will remain within hailing distance now, until this is settled one way or another. Ha, Kull! If it comes to a pitched battle, the streets and the castles of Illusia will run red. Kull smiled grimly. He would greet any sort of action with a ferocious joy. This wandering in a labyrinth of illusion and magic was extremely irksome to his nature. He longed for the leap and clang of swords, for the joyous freedom of battle. Then, into the hall of society came two again, and the rest of the councillors. Lord King, the hour of the council is at hand, and we stand ready to escort you to the council room. Cull rose, and the councillors bent the knee as he passed through the way opened by them for his passage, rising behind him and following. Eyebrows were raised as the Pict strode defiantly behind the king, but no one dissented. Brule's challenging gaze swept the smooth faces of the councillors with the defiance of an intruding savage. The group passed through the halls and came at last to the council chamber. The door was closed as usual, and the councillors arranged themselves in the order of their rank before the dais upon which stood the king. Like a bronze statue, Brule took up his stand behind Cull. Cull swept the room with a swift stare. Surely no chance of treachery here. Seventeen councillors there were, all known to him. All of them had espoused his cause when he ascended the throne. Men of Volusia, he began in the conventional manner, then halted, perplexed. The councillors had risen as a man and were moving toward him. There was no hostility in their looks, but their actions were strange for a council room. The foremost was close to him when Brule sprang forward, crouched like a leopard. Ka Nama! Ka Lajarama! His voice crackled through the sinister silence of the room, and the foremost counselor recoiled, hand flashing to his robes, and like a spring released, Brule moved, and the man pitched headlong to the glint of his sword. Headlong he pitched and lay still while his face faded and became the head of a mighty snake. "'Slay, Cull!' rasped the Pict's voice. "'They be all serpent men!' The rest was a scarlet maze. Cull saw the familiar faces dim like fading fog, and in their places gaped horrid reptilian visages as the whole band rushed forward. His mind was dazed, but his giant body faltered not. The singing of his sword filled the room, and the onrushing flood broke in a red wave. But they surged forward again, seemingly willing to fling their lives away in order to drag down the king. Hideous jaws gaped at him, terrible eyes blazed into his unblinkingly. A frightful, fetid scent pervaded the atmosphere, the serpent scent that Cull had known in southern jungles. Swords and daggers leaped at him and he was dimly aware that they wounded him. But Cull was in his element. Never before had he faced such grim foes, but it mattered little. They lived. Their veins held blood that could be spilt, and they died when his great sword cleft their skulls or drove through their bodies. Slash, thrust, thrust, and swing. Yet had Cull died there but for the man who crouched at his side, parrying and thrusting. For the king was clear berserk, 
fighting in a terrible Atlantean way that seeks death to deal death. He made no effort to avoid thrusts and slashes, standing straight up and ever plunging forward, no thought in his frenzied mind but to slay. Not often did Cull forget his fighting craft in his primitive fury. But now some chain had broken in his soul, flooding his mind with a red wave of slaughter lust. He slew a foe at each blow, but they surged about him, and time and again Brule turned a thrust that would have slain, as he crouched beside Cull, parrying and warding with cold skill, slaying not as Cull slew with long slashes and plunges, but with short overhand blows and upward thrusts. Cull laughed, a laugh of insanity. The frightful faces swirled about him in a scarlet blaze. He felt steel sink into his arm and dropped his sword in a flashing arc that cleft his foe to the breastbone. Then the mists faded, and the king saw that he and Brule stood alone above a sprawl of hideous crimson figures who lay still upon the floor. Valka! What a killing! said Brule, shaking the blood from his eyes. Cull! Had these been warriors who knew how to use the steel, we had died here. These serpent priests know not of swordcraft, and die easier than any men I ever slew. Yet had there been a few more, I think the matter had ended otherwise. Cull nodded. The wild berserker blaze had passed, leaving a mazed feeling of great weariness. Blood seeped from wounds on breast, shoulder, arm and leg. Brule himself, bleeding from a score of flesh wounds, glanced at him in some concern. Lord Cull, let us hasten to have your wounds dressed by the women. Cull thrust him aside with a drunken sweep of his mighty arm. Nay, we'll see this through ere we cease. Go you, though, and have your wounds seen to. I command it. The Pict laughed grimly. Your wounds are more than mine, Lord King he began, then stopped as a sudden thought struck him. By Valka, Cull! This is not the council room! Cull looked about, and suddenly other fogs seemed to fade. Nay, this is the room where Eolal died a thousand years ago, since unused and named accursed. Then by the gods they tricked us after all! exclaimed Brule in a fury, kicking the corpses at their feet. They caused us to walk like fools into their ambush. By their magic they changed the appearance of all. Then there is further deviltry afoot, said Cull. For if there be true men in the councils of Elusia, they should be in the real council room now. Come swiftly. And leaving the room with its ghastly keepers, they hastened through halls that seemed deserted until they came to the real council room. Then Cull halted with a ghastly shudder. From the council room sounded a voice speaking, and the voice was his. With a hand that shook, he parted the tapestries and gazed into the room. There sat the councillors, counterparts of the men he and Brule had just slain, and upon the dais stood Cull, king of Volusia. He stepped back, his mind reeling. This is insanity, he whispered. Am I Cull? Do I stand here, or is that Cull yonder in very truth, and I am but a shadow, a figment of thought? Brule's hand clutching his shoulder, shaking him fiercely, brought him to his senses. Valka's name be not a fool! Can you yet be astounded after all we have seen? See you not that those are true men bewitched by a snake-man who has taken your form, as those others took their forms? By now you should have been slain, and yon monster reigning in your stead, unknown by those who bowed to you. Leap and slay swiftly, or else we are undone. The red slayers, true men, stand close on each hand, and none but you can reach and slay him. Be swift! Cull shook off the onrushing dizziness, flung back his head in the old defiant gesture. He took a long, deep breath, as does a strong swimmer before diving into the sea. 
then, sweeping back the tapestries, made the dais in a single lion-like bound. Brule had spoken truly. There stood men of the Red Slayers, guardsmen trained to move quick as the striking leopard. Any but Cull had died ere he could reach the usurper. But the sight of Cull, identical with a man upon the dais, held them in their tracks. Their minds stunned for an instant. And that was long enough. He upon the dais snatched for his sword, but even as his fingers closed upon the hilt, Cull's sword stood out behind his shoulders, and the thing that men had thought the king pitched forward from the dais to lie silent upon the floor. Hold! Cull's lifted hand and kingly voice stopped the rush that had started, and while they stood astounded, he pointed to the thing which lay before them, whose face was fading into that of a snake. They recoiled, and from one door came Brule, and from another came Kanu. These grasped the king's bloody hand, and Kanu spoke. Men of Volusia, you have seen with your own eyes. This is the true Kull, the mightiest king to whom Volusia has ever bowed. The power of the serpent is broken, and ye be all true men. King Kull, have you commands? Lift that carrion, said Kull and men of the guard took up the thing. "'Now follow me,' said the king, and he made his way to the accursed room. Brule, with a look of concern, offered the support of his arm, but Kull shook him off. The distance seemed endless to the bleeding king, but at last he stood at the door and laughed fiercely and grimly when he heard the horrified ejaculations of the councillors. At his orders, the guardsmen flung the corpse they carried beside the others, and motioning all from the room, Cull stepped out last and closed the door. A wave of dizziness left him shaken. The faces turned to him, pallid and wonderingly, swirled and mingled in a ghostly fog. He felt the blood from his wounds trickling down his limbs, and he knew that what he was to do he must do quickly or not at all. His sword rasped from its sheath. Brule, are you there? Aye. Brule's face looked at him through the mist, close to his shoulder, but Brule's voice sounded leagues and eons away. Remember our vow, Brule. And now, bid them stand back. His left arm cleared a space as he flung up his sword. Then, with all his waning power, he drove it through the door into the jam driving the great sword to the hilt and sealing the room forever. Legs braced wide, he swayed drunkenly, facing the horrified counselors. Let this room be doubly accursed, and let those rotting skeletons lie there forever as a sign of the dying might of the serpent. Here I swear that I shall hunt the serpent men from land to land, from sea to sea, giving no rest until all be slain, that good triumph and the power of hell be broken. This thing I swear, I, Kull, king of Volusia. His knees buckled as the faces swayed and swirled. The counselors leaped forward, but ere they could reach him, Kull slumped to the floor and lay still, face upward. The counselors surged about the fallen king, chattering and shrieking. Kanu beat them back with his clenched fists, cursing savagely. Back, you fools! Would you stifle the little life that is yet in him? How, Brule? Is he dead, or will he live? To the warrior who bent above the prostrate cull. Dead, sneered Brule irritably. Such a man as this is not so easily killed. Lack of sleep and loss of blood have weakened him. By Valka, he has a score of deep wounds, but none of them mortal. Yet have those gibbering fools bring the court women here at once. Brule's eyes lighted with a fierce, proud light. Valka, Kanu! But here is such a man as I knew not existed in these degenerate days— 
he will be in the saddle in a few scant days, and then may the serpent men of the world beware of Cull of Volusia. Valka, but that will be a rare hunt. Ah, I see long years of prosperity for the world with such a king upon the throne of Volusia. Hi, I'm Jesse. I'm um, Tamahome. Hi, I'm Jim. Jim Moon from the Hypnagoria website and the Hypnobobs podcast. Indeedy. And we are talking about The Shadow Kingdom by Robert E. Howard, a King Call story that I think everybody's just heard. But um, how do we know that you're really you? You have to say the magic word. The magic word is Ka Namaka Lajarama, I believe. It's Ka uh, Namaka Lajaramama. Uh oh. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm wearing the magic ring of the dragon jewel. <laughs> you can't see well, it. You know, yeah, the uh, armlet, the dragon armlet. Mm. I can't see it. It's not a video podcast, so uh, we'll have to show you. You just have to trust me. Yeah. Um,. I, I think the first time I read this story, I thought that when you say the magic word, what would happen, or the magic phrase, is the snake man would show himself to be a snake man, but actually he has to say it for for you to know that he's a snake man. Mm. Because by him being in, unable to say it, that makes him obviously a snake man. So if you have like a lisp or something, you're going to be in trouble in the <laughs> kingdom. But uh, it's funny that uh, Howard doesn't use the phrase, or the word that describes this this thing. And I, I guess when I first read this story, I didn't know that there was such a word. It's a shibboleth, is what it's called. If I'm pronouncing the shibboleth correctly, have you yep. guys heard it? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a biblical thing, I think. Uh, I don't know what that is. Okay, so it's uh, in the Book of Judges, chapter twelve. The inhabitants of Gilead are infected by a oh, sorry, inflicted uh, military defeat upon the tribe of Ephraim. And the Ephraimites tried to cross the Jordan River back into their home territory. Um, and so in order to uh, tell which of these people was good, they, Gilead put a test to the refugees. And um, it was basically, are you an Ephraimite? And they said, no. Very well, then, say shibboleth. And if they pronounced it sibboleth instead of shibboleth, then they were executed because it's like a regional pronunciation difference. Mm. I know Mr. Jim Moon, when he pronounces the letter after G in the alphabet, it doesn't sound the same as when I pronounce it. Mm. Hello, Mr. Jim Moon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you guys say H, not H, right? Uh, well, it's a bit of both. <laughs> it depends on the word. <laughs> I always, I always like, what's the le- what's the letter after G in the English alphabet? It's mm. H, and I say, what? That's so strange. <laughs> and Canadians say Z instead of zero. Ye- or Z. Well, no, <laughs> yeah, instead of. Z, Z is, but yeah, so a lot of the rapper names don't work for us. It's <laughs> J Z. <laughs> doesn't work for us. I'll have to um, rename it for Canadian distribution. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think they, they're not thinking, uh, internationally because I, I think the United States is the only place that says Z. Yeah, it's pretty much because we, we say Z over here. I think Australia is mm-hmm. Z and New London. You're all wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But uh, in reading up on this, I found out that uh, Isaac Asimov came up with a really good one um, uh, for attesting uh, whether someone was a chemist or not, because he was a chemist. um, And it was how you pronounce the word U-N-I-O-N-I-Z-E-D. Which is, <laughs> you guys, Kevin? Nope. <laughs> you guys? 
unionized. Uh. <laughs> and regular people would say unionized. Especially, I guess, uh, those with socialist bent. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're sort of getting off topic of the story. So uh, I think this is the fourth or fifth time I read this story, which is pretty unusual for me. I don't usually read stories that many times um, in life. But this is a nice, relatively short one. I think it's pretty good. What do you guys think of it? Oh, I really enjoy it. I mean, I've read it several times down the years. It's, I mean, I like a bit of Howard, and I'm always drawn to King Cull more than some of his other heroes um, mm-hmm. because he's, I think, they're just a bit gloomier and a bit more brooding. Um, where Conan's quite almost happy-go-lucky in comparison. Yeah, he's got uh, he's. Uh, sort of adventurous spirit, where his call is mm. more resigned to the the situation. He's in the introduction they call him more philosophical. The thinking man's barbarian. Yeah, he's a he's a little more philosophical, and so like, like you know, in this story, he he doesn't just go up and kill everybody. He he says, "Wait, maybe I'm not really me." <laughs> and the, the regular barbarian says. Uh, no, you're really you, and let's go kill those guys. Mm. <laughs> Tam, this is your first time, right? Yeah. It, you need- it, it seemed more <laughs> fantastical than the Conan stories I've read. Like, there's a lot of things about uh, Snake Man and possibly werewolves and yeah, there, there, people there transforming. A, yeah, there there was a, a, quite a big leave open for uh, Wolfman, yeah, that was not... It was not uh, done anything with in this story, but I believe other cult stories, uh, at least in the comics, they I, I'm not sure about other Howard stories, but other cult stories have dealt with that. And I, I know there's another cult story that uh, has a talking cat. <laughs> yeah, they, they talk about all these animal people that ruled the world back in mm-hmm. the day, and men finally conquered them. That was kind of a cool history. It's it's a it's pretty interesting, um, you know. It's like uh, I guess the Hyborian kingdoms, but it's different, and it sort of has the, some of the same things. So the Picts are still there, but uh, the Atlanteans are are long gone by the time Conan's around. Yes, because this is um, this is the Thurian Age, which is roughly twenty thousand years BC. And then afterwards, the great cataclysm that gets rid of Mu, Lemuria, most of Atlantis. And it's after that you get the rise of Hyboria in the time of Conan, which is about 10,000 BC, roughly. There's got to be another cataclysm after that, though. Otherwise, the world wouldn't look like it does on the map. I guess uh, it's been more than... Yeah, that's 9550 BC, the final cataclysm. All right. <laughs> There's three in this timeline, which is kind of... It's a shared timeline because like Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith, and Howard were pretty much carving up this early prehistory and <laughs> adding these mythological ages. So, no, I so calls from Atlantis, the same Atlantis that like sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Yep. Yes, but it, they're barbarians at this time, so I guess they have to civilize themselves a little bit more. Well, this is after, before Cull's time, there was another cataclysm. <laughs> oh, the original okay. Atlanteans were pretty much wiped out and went back to barbarism. And that's kind of where Cull's Atlanteans come in and they're just, they're the fallen remnants. And later they'll rise again and become powerful sorcerers again and then get wiped out by the, the next cat- passing cataclysm. And, and then finally get mentioned by Plato. That's it. And... Uh, <laughs> And that's that's kicks it all off again, well, or starts it off to begin with. Hey, and where does Patrick Duffy fit in? <laughs> Man from Atlantis. Is that uh, Nemoir? Or? I oh, know, or, it was a TV mm, show. Yeah. Okay. He could swim in the water and stuff. <laughs> kind of like uh, talk, talk to Dolph. Fins, I remember as well. Well, it's either uh, uh, you know, grow gills or drown, I guess, right? <laughs> The sea barbarians. <laughs> now, I I noted a lot of interesting scenes. This has got a lot of set piece uh, setups, 
but it also um, it it was a little bit confusing to me because, and I, I would assume a lot of other readers, as you read it, you don't know any of the place names, so you don't know any of the times, um, so you have to learn as you go. So, for example, when Cull, right at the beginning of the story, is talking to his courtiers and uh, I guess the other people who are begging indulgences from him, he he gets a visit from uh, Brule, the spear slayer who doesn't go by that name, and he invites him to a dinner party, I guess, uh, at some time <laughs> that's mentioned, like, it's like when the moon is in full blank, right? <laughs> and we don't know when that is. It turns out that that's actually tonight. So, yes. <laughs> uh, I thought it was like he's going to have to go on a, uh, you know, sea voyage to go to the Pictish Isles or something. But no, it's just tonight. Well, so, the way the way it's phrased, and what you would have me come alone, it, it does suggest it's going to be this dangerous voyage rather than this soiree that it turns out to be. <laughs> and it also turns out that it's um it's it's in the same building. Yes, it's just a giant, <laughs> mm. giant tower. What's it? The Tower of Splendor, right? And I, I was thinking, well, if it's in the same building, how how dangerous could it be? You've got to have, still have guards around. <laughs> Um, but it also gives you the sense that it's a massive, massive city. If if you've got a a, a palace that's so big that it can inc- incorporate the embassies of of uh, your allies and your, uh, uh, it's also unclear whether it's an. They talk about it being an empire and also a kingdom. So he's he's lord he's lord king at sometimes and then. Uh, Valuria is the, sa- the kingdom of the seven em- no the empire of the seven kingdoms, mm. and when you look at maps of the Valu- uh, the Thurian age, it shows you know borders and stuff. But I'm not sure that Howard actually made any of that up. I think it was just people trying to figure out what the hell he's talking about, <laughs> because it, it's really not. We never even leave the the palace basically in this whole story. Well, that's no, one of those things. It's got on subsequent rereadings. It's kind of, I think, what you're getting at. You know, the so-called palace is actually like almost like a huge city complex, and the present-day Volusians, they're kind of they're literally kind of squatting and living in the remnants of an older civilization, and you know, um, it's you know, it's like a huge place that's. Whether you know people don't know where everything actually is, because you know in the story it's a big deal about all the secret passageways that that are riddling the place and secret chambers that have been forgotten over the years, <laughs> or maybe you know the current Volusians never even knew they were there. It's so big they they can lose whole rooms and sections. Mm. It's like a mall. They need the the map. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's yeah, it is kind of like a mall. Um, at the end of the, there's, I think, is there five chapters? Um, yeah, I think so. They're pretty short, but uh, at the f- end of the first chapter, uh, King Call's sort of mulling things over um, uh, before he goes to the dinner party, and then he starts talking to himself, and I was like, why is he doing that? <laughs> is he crazy? <laughs> um, he says, uh, I am Call, said he, and there's no one there in the room. <laughs> flinging back his head as a lion flings back his mane. I am Cull! He ex- exclamation point. And then, his falcon gaze swept the ancient hall. His self-confidence flowed back, and in the dim nook of the hall, a tapestry moved slightly. What's funny is that because it, it of the later uh, events, that he finds out that, you know, he's surrounded by snake men, you'd think that he wouldn't have this need to reassure himself that he is who he is. But as soon as he says, I am Cull, and he says it twice, and, and, and second time with an exclamation point, it's like he's, oh, yes, yes, I am. He's agreeing with himself. Uh, yes, I definitely am Cull. But that makes me question whether he really is, because the snake man, we assume they don't, they don't know. They do know that they are just pretending to be whoever they are, right? There's a guy who eventually pretends to be Cull. Isn't it a strange strange thing to end with that on the first chapter? <laughs> it is just a bit, but it's kind of, I think it's, I think 
Howard's point, um, somewhat crudely done, is that King Colette does have this like identity crisis because he's the ruler of a race mm-hmm. that is not his own. Um, and there's a big play of that in the in the coming story about the you know Volusia, his empire has certain affiliations with the Picts, but his own mm. race, his birth race, are mortal enemies with them. And there's all these this back and forth of tribal loyalties and identity, and it's kind of. I see it as kind of, you know, you finish doing a bit of kingy, and you go, right, I am me, I am me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, after mm-hmm. putting aside all these different hats he's been wearing to uh, to rule the kingdom. So, I mean, that's something that comes through in later stories, is that, you know, where most barbarians, the saga ends, I am king now, ha, 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 ha. King Cull, the story start with, I'm king, oh, bloody hell, knock it off, stop trying to depose me. <laughs> Mm. You know what I mean? It's kind of it's constant powers hard to keep hold of, and being mm-hmm. it is not good to be a king, as Mel Brooks said. Mm-hmm. I was just kind of thinking yeah. that barbarians talk about themselves in the third person. <laughs> Didn't Conan do that? Conan uh, does a bit, and it's kind of uh, he's later carried on by pirates as well. That kind of <laughs> Conan you know, is hungry. I'm, mm. <laughs> I'm I'm listening to a Jared Diamond book right now that I'm really enjoying, and um, apparently uh, he doesn't talk about barbarians. Barbarian is you know is a sort of a slur term against non-civilized people by people who think they're civilized. Um, but he does talk about uh, traditional societies, he, you know, hunter-gatherer societies, and he was saying that um, in the book he says that uh, these traditional people talk to themselves constantly and not just to themselves, but to everyone around them. And they talk about the same subjects over and over again. Um, and it's not like, you know, what the, what, what books they're reading. It's about, you know, their environment and, uh, birds and food and sex and more food, lots and lots of food talk because the majority of their day is focused on gathering and hunting. So they, you know, at night they'll, they'll talk about hunting stories um, and they'll talk, you know, about everything, but they never stop talking. And maybe that's, <laughs> I don't think Howard has any direct experience with, uh, such people, but it sort of fits. He, he can't not talk mm-hmm. to himself even when he's alone. Well, I think he's kind of, cause you know, the, the cool story, I think kind of have a, um, a more purple depth of language and some of his other heroes, and he's this kind of weighty, somber, very dramatic. And I think the kind of third person talking is kind of, it is, as you say, that kind of barbarian idiom. But I think mm-hmm. it's also the Shakespeare, a touch of the Shakespearean, you know, soliloquy mm. to it as well. There's that, yeah. There's an, a lot of internal monologues um, or uh, internal thinking but there's also you know he doesn't stick to one kind of way of storytelling because he's very happy to describe how you know manly somebody looks and and uh how you know king calls completely shocked by something somebody says but his face gives nothing away mm. <laughs> he's like a he's like a statue and uh even even the mercenaries they you know they won't smile or salute anybody but Wow, they see King Cull up there and they think, wow, that's a manly man. <laughs> well, they won't give it away, but they think it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the tension is there. It's mm. there. There. Um, I, I was thinking of the Hulk, too. Hulk, Hulk will smash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a, little, he's a little wiser than the Hulk, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I think he seems a little more... Uh, uh, unlike Conan seems to be able to kill anybody and anything, and he does get injured, but not very much. Whereas Cull really takes quite a beating in this, and he mm-hmm. almost is unable to walk. He collapses at the end. Um, and the, I thought that was a little more realistic. This is one of uh, the earliest uh, Howard stories in Weird Tales, I think. It's not the earliest, but I think it's one of the earliest. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure... I don't. I don't think there was a lot more in Weird Tales of Cull. It was only three stories um, right. of 
the I don't know the handful he actually wrote about Cole actually appeared in Weird Tales, and all the rest appeared after his death. Mm-hmm. Um, the Shadow Kingdom was one. Uh, so these were stories that he wrote, but he never released, and then the estate released them. <laughs> Yeah, I think they were released uh, in the seventies with mm. uh, selected. You know, when when the books started getting republished, uh, the Conan and the other things were re- being republished. There's uh, sort of a demand built up, and and off the uh, editors found found things, and I think they were submitted, but they just weren't purchased. Mm. No. Well, this is it. There's a, a cool story um, by this axe I rule. Which he, mm. I know he did send off, which did get rejected, and he ended up rewriting it, and he wrote it so much it became the first Conan story, which is also yeah a king story, mm. right? Mm. King Conan rather than regular Conan. Mm. Hmm. So in 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 a, in a way, some people uh, say you know he is the cull is sort of the the first run at the the idea of Conan, and you know they're they're pretty similar. Uh, backgrounds of pretty similar life stories. It's just that Cull is um, we we don't ever see him not as king. He he thinks back to all his his adventures, but he never we never actually go there. Oh Whereas no, there we, is there is one. Um, is there? This is Exile from Atlantis. Okay, right. Uh, that's the first. Yeah, which one is in this which, yeah, it was book. the first one before he's a king. Um, but then the Shadow Kingdom's the next one, um, and he is king, <laughs> and the rest follow from that. We get the sense that. that he's sort of a new king, right? He hasn't been doing this job for mm. years and years. He's sort of new at the job, and he's sort of getting used to the idea that he has to spend all day listening to people asking him for favors. Yes. <laughs> he's not super happy about that, so this is sort of a welcome distraction, perhaps. <laughs> Um, the other, uh, you know, the thing that I was drawn to this story about, I guess, in thinking what which one to do out of that collection is, I was thinking that this story has actually, uh, I was talking to you, Mr. Jim Moon, about this before the podcast mm-hmm. started, how it's a, it's got really sort of a science fiction idea, or as, at least an idea that you see in science fiction quite a lot, but it does it and this is from 1929, so it's before, really, the major ideas of such things in science fiction could have come around. You know, Philip K. Dick's not around yet. There's no Robert Sheckley. Uh, none of, nobody who could tackle an idea like this in science fiction is really writing. I, I was thinking of the thing, too. Uh, who goes there? Is that what it's called? Mm. Well, how so? Well, you know that where they have to test each person to see if uh-huh. they're the monster mm-hmm. or human by uh, putting it in a, a wire into their blood or something, mm-hmm. and the blood will crawl away if it's the alien blood. Right. Yeah, I I didn't think of that one, but the the one I was thinking of is the one that we actually did as a podcast uh, um, by Ray Nelson called Eight O'clock in the Morning, which is uh, got turned into the movie um, They Live. Yeah. You know oh, They Live was based on something? Mm. Oh, yeah. They Live is based on a short story we did mm. as a podcast with uh, the author, um, Ray Nelson. And that's a story about a guy who has a... Uh, he goes to a hypnotist meeting, or I guess a hypnotist show, and is brought up on stage and is hypnotized, and then when the hypnotist awakes him, he accidentally fully awakes instead of being just regular awake like everybody, he awakes to the full reality of the world. And when he looks out into the sea of faces in the audience, he can see that scattered amongst them are basically aliens, the owners of the earth, who uh, look like us, but uh, are really wearing a, a human mask over a an alien face, and that they have hypnotized us to this this fact. And that Dot, 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 right? Oh. Does he say that he chew gum and kick ass and he's all out of gum? <laughs> it's not in the short story, but that, I think that is a, a very well done improvement for the movie. In the movie, uh, it's it's uh, not a hypnotist, it's a sunglasses, right? Mm. Right. The sunglasses are a nice visual way of showing 
the the idea in 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 this story again it seems like you say the words and then the other guy's face appears uh to show themselves as a snake but really that's not what happens they have no way of knowing whether someone is or is not a snake man except by their actions yeah they get pissed off or something when you say that Yes. Kind of guess Are you it. Snake Man, and they get really angry and try and kill you? Then, then you well, that's always them. kind of. If you say the word to them, then they know they're rumbled, and then you know right. they're they're going to bump you off quietly if possible. <laughs> right. I mean, one thing I thought um, is it is it's a very ahead of its time version, like invasion of the body snatchers as well. Mm-hmm. So the idea of the you know, these kind of not so much perhaps body snatchers itself, but all the kind of once that idea was sown in science fiction, you get a lot of stories about alien replicants, who mm-hmm. you know people who come in and they take over and replace key people to, you know, this kind of stealthy, you know, behind the scenes invasion, the quiet invasion. Mm-hmm. There's a great Philip K. Dick short story that was published almost exactly the same time. Um, it might have even been before. Uh, the invasion of the body snatchers. And uh, it's about a guy he's digging in his basement. Uh, he's b- building a new foundation in his house. And when he comes up, he, he he's like, oh, I better go to work. So he goes to work. And on the way in, he sees a, uh, a human being hung from a, a lamppost in the middle of the town square. And he's like, what the hell's going on? And he runs into his store and says, what the hell's going on, guys? There's a human being hanging from a lamppost outside, and they, they, they're like, what? What are you talking about? Oh, so, oh, oh that. Uh, it's probably an advertisement or something. It's like, what are you talking about? Turns out that everybody's everybody has uh, been turned into an alien, and this is their way of finding out who is not an alien. <laughs> and it's like, wow. It, it, it's a, it is a powerful idea. Identity and figuring out who you are, but in this story, Cole even questions himself. I just, I think that's so awesome that how, I can't believe Howard would do that because he's he is. You think of him as such a um, uh, purple prose uh, action man, but he does have this scene where the guy's questioning himself and he's saying, "I'm not sure that I'm even me. Is this me or is that me in there? How would I know?" And then it just takes the 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 barbarian to say no come on let's go kill those guys like, <laughs> you I know you're you <laughs> yeah I mean that impressed me I mean it always impresses me that that turn as it were it the, the big reveal because it's really interesting that it's kind of well am I is that me <laughs> no. yeah whether or not that's coward sort of thing giving him kind of this kind of um, alternative perspective as a barbarian or whether it's just part of that kind of that philosophical Ben mm-hmm. Cole has because when, he, when he's going to the meeting, there's this whole wonderfully written sequence of where the horses' hooves seem to be speaking out for the buildings, and the buildings are going, <laughs> "We're older than you. You're nothing. Your time will come and pass. We'll endure." Um, which you know gives you kind of an idea of kind of where Cole's head's at. He's very aware as an outsider that his position is temporary, and I think you know when he sees the the serpent man duplicate is kind of well am i am i real at all i'm you know <laughs> he's that far down the rabbit hole at this point ruling an alien land yeah and and that that sort of lovecraft's theme as well right he is looking at in the introduction to this book they they call it deep time right the geologic time uh and the pointlessness of existence in the universe that is so old that, that you're just a speck in its in its uh, timeline that will be forgotten and lost to history. Uh, that sh- sort of shows up in the fact that this is, you know, it is so set far back in our history that we don't even remember it. And yet, in that time period, of course, they're referring to this this phrase "ka nama ka la drama." Doesn't they don't even know what it means? Yeah. They just know that it means. Uh, it will tell whether you're a snake man or not. It, it's lost its its meaning because it's been so long since the world was ruled by snakes and wolfmen and whatever. We don't even remember that part. Catmen. Catmen. 
Um, and you know, there, there's a sort of a, uh, a phenomenon. <laughs> I don't know how many subscribers there are to it, but I think it might start with this, this story. In the, in the real world, there are people who think that there are, that, you know, the leaders of the United Nations and the president and uh, various, uh, I don't know, uh, political leaders are actually snake men from <laughs> or aliens from other planets. <laughs> and they say, you know, look at this video. And they say on YouTube, look at this video. You can see his snake face reveal itself <laughs> for a second. And like, what? <laughs> Have they just read this story and forgotten they read it? <laughs> yeah, sometimes I think... I think of, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, sometimes I think of Congress as like maybe another race... It seems so separate from the rest of us. And that, I think, works as well. That works on another level. What were you going to say, Jim? Well, was, um, I think, you know, I don't think that idea of the reptoids necessarily goes back to the Shadow Kingdom, but it probably does indirectly because um, it's the basis of V as well. Yeah, it is V. I, and mean, I think V got the idea probably from the Shadow Kingdom, the idea of... Huh. Uh, the, the serpents hiding behind human masks. Huh. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking, I didn't know the word for it. Yeah, reptoids is one of the ones. Reptilians, draconians, um, are purported reptilian humanoids that play a prominent role in science fiction as well as modern ufology and conspiracy theories. The ideas of reptilians on Earth was popularized by David Icke a conspiracy theorist who says shape-shifting reptilian people control our world by taking the human form and gaining political power to manipulate our societies. I claimed it multiple occasions that many of the world leaders are or are possessed by reptilians attempting to gain power over the world. Um, it, yeah, and then it, it does argue for V and uh, lizard people. and um, But... I'm thinking, like, it does, it works on that level, right? Uh, I was thinking, if you think of this story as metaphorical, um, and, you know, I don't normally look at Howard's stories that way. I think they're just fun adventures uh, with sort of a a, a lot of color. Mm -hmm. I don't normally think of him as a, a, a message guy. Um, but in this particular story, you could think of, like, a snake man is a, a man you can't trust. How do you know you can trust somebody? Well, uh, our guy Brule, he doesn't trust uh, our our uh, our Cull, and Cull doesn't trust Brule. And Cull even says at the beginning, he says, well, it's well known that all, uh, all Picts lie, and yet he doesn't even believe that. He knows that it's actually the opposite is true. Mm. And he's trying to get a rise out of him so that they could, you know, later on come to be blood brothers, even though they're mortal enemies, right? They're they're the best of friends at the end of the story, and I think subsequent uh, uh, stories have them as best friends as well. Mm. So there's there's something metaphorical happening, um, and I was thinking, well, it's like Jews in a society of Germans, right? They look like us, they sound like us, but are they really us? Uh, well, you have to know. How do you know? Well, find out. And it's it's this fear of uh, sort of a paranoia of trust that is there's something to the basis of this. And and then when you add in the fact that, well, is that really me? Can I trust myself? He is saying, who am I really? Am I the barbarian who, you know, attacked and harried my way to uh, to this position, or am I the king now? It's a it's a, a very deep story for Howard, I think. Well, there's also the element as well of kind of it's the old regime versus the new, of kind of um, it's almost like um, to be a bit frivolous a yes minister situation. Mm. <laughs> where you have the new leader right. coming in saying, I want to forge your head, do this, that, and the other. And all his advisors are really snake men. Going, oh, yes, yes, but no, we <laughs> can't actually. And, um, <laughs> you know, keeping things just the way they want them. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, there's a strong element of that sort of new broom versus old guard 
you know, in there as well as a metaphor. <laughs> yeah. It's it, it, it's uh it's it's quite delightful. I, I'm I'm a big fan of this story. Yeah, I was kind of thrown when uh, he seems to kill Brule, like somewhere in the middle. But it turns out to be a Snake Man pretending to be Brule. Yeah, there's a uh, it's the it's the the amulet on his arm, I guess, or whatever it is, the uh, dra- dragon wristlet or mm. bracelet. Makes makes it clear that that's you know that's him, um, but the Snake Man. I, I guess they can only can they only replicate people's faces, or can, can't they replicate uh, you know make you think clothing. they're wearing certain clothing? I don't know. They have well, at one point you know Cull is is there. I guess they had an extra cape, a Cull cape around, and whatever else he was wearing. It, it does it does feel feel sort of like a superhero story in that way as well. Uh, I guess it's yeah. kryptonite then. They they can't yeah. reproduce it. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, it was uh, maybe the because it has a dragon on it. Maybe that was that was their that was their old enemy in history. Yeah, I thought the humans were the old enemy, but it's 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 unclear. Um, there's no mention of what the name of the snake. These are actually snake priests, right? They're serpent priests, but there's no mention of the god's name that they worship, right? Uh, in later Conan stuff, it's Set, isn't it? S-E-T? Um, I think so. Um, I know kind of, I get confused if you've got serpent men turn up in other sort of mythos fiction where mm. it's said they worship, um, one of Lovecraft's gods, Yig. Yig. Um, okay. I know Yig has, turns up in other Howard stories, but I can't remember keep if it turns up in relation with the Serpent Men, um, or it's a later age of Serpent Men, might worship Yig. Um, I think it's a Bran McMahon story where he encounters the last sort of degenerate survivors of them. I think it's the Worms of the Earth. The uh, Egyptian god Set or Seth is the one I, I guess I was thinking of, is uh, the usurper who mutilated his own brother Osiris. And then he's the god of deserts, storms, and foreigners. But he doesn't, he's not a snake. He's a, uh, he's a, I don't know, dog headed dude or something. Who did they worship in the first Conan movie? Was that set? Uh, in, uh, yeah. in the so first that, Conan that, movie, it's a, snake, yeah. it's a snake cult. And the yeah, sorcerer, right. Tulsa Doom, uh, is actually yeah. from cult stories, not Conan stories. Oh. Yeah, it's fun because that story, yeah, that first movie is more of a cult. Cull adventure in that sense, right? It well, does have that. Yeah, Conan's background in that is similar, more similar to Cull's than it is to Conan as written as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, that 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 whole um, snake worshiping uh, thing is is actually almost taken from this story. I think you remember in the beginning of the story when, or I guess when he's gone to the meeting at the at the ambassador's house. He or residence, whatever it is, inside the the temple, the tower. He he says, "How can I trust you to the ambassador?" And the ambassador says, "Well, if I showed you this, then you'd trust me." And he shows him a jewel that was stolen. This he's, Conan, uh, sorry, Cull says, "This stolen jewel." And like, I'm what stolen jewel? That's not in the story. It's like before some year, you know, the year before or something. Somebody has had. A jewel stolen. It turns out that it was stolen from the snake god's uh, temple, and that's what that jewel is. Now that is actually in the first Conan movie, uh, the original mm. Conan the Barbarian movie. The, the guy who goes and steals that is uh, Conan. Um, so there is a lot of mixing and matching uh, in the Conan movie. But you, did you guys see the Cull movie? There was a cult movie as oh, well. Oh, the, the Kevin Sorbo one. <laughs> uh, I've avoided that so far. <laughs> oh my! It's it's uh, there's no rule, um, but it's it's uh, it's not totally dissimilar from this story. Uh, there's there's no rule at all, um, but it's actually the origin of how he becomes king, and uh, it's pretty awful. It's it's not god awful, but it's pretty awful. But the the thing that makes it so 
ruinously bad is, is the, the music is pretty much normal, but there's a couple of scenes where it just turns into like heavy metal guitar. <laughs> <laughs> the first scene, I think, uh, on a battlefield, it's like heavy metal guitar. And then uh, I guess there's a middle scene with another big battle scene. Uh, there's a battle scene throughout the whole thing, but there's just, you know, heavy metal guitar. It's like big hair. Uh, <laughs> big hair. This, this is sounding better to me now. It should have been in the 80s, really. I mean, it, if you look at it as um, as a uh, a farce, it, it's pretty good. <laughs> but it's not a good movie. It's not a good call story. So it's not tongue-in-cheek uh, like the Hercules TV series, it's, the same guy? I don't supposed to be tongue in cheek. Uh, there's not a lot of laughs. Uh there's a they make try to make a couple of jokes, but uh the story is is pretty weak. Uh and it, it it's it's much more Conan the Destroyer than it is Conan the Barbarian. I'm talking mm. the first oh, no. era. <laughs> Yeah. Um but but it's actually better than Conan the Destroyer, which isn't saying much. <laughs> uh, the um the one thing that I did like about it is they did tend to keep most of the names. Um, I think the uh, Culls uh, advisor is named Two. Um, I think they all say Valka all the time, the, the god, and they actually go visit a cave with Valka's face carved into it, and it's it's not god awful. <laughs> This has been the SFF Audio Podcast. Please join us at www.sffaudio.com.